Good morning. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. Delighted to welcome you all here. Um, thank you for paddling here uh, this morning on a soggy uh, Friday morning in July. Um, let me recognize our online audience. In addition to the many people in the room, we have a, a strong online uh, audience. You're welcome to uh, follow us on Twitter, at CSIS, and tweet, tweet away. Um, please turn off all of your noisemakers um, and other devices uh, so we don't disrupt the speakers. Um, we have uh, started a tradition of doing events like this ahead of these uh, big summits. Uh, the G20 is the biggest of them all in the world, in the area I work on. Um, it will be held in uh, Labor Day, just after Labor Day, uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, and uh, we normally would do this two or three weeks out, but because of the summer holidays and everything, we thought we'd get an early start. So we are uh, delighted to have a, a terrific lineup of speakers today, um, which we'll get started with in just one second. Um, we'll have, uh, after um, our uh, two keynote speakers, the Russian ambassador and the uh, U.S. Sherpa, we will uh, have two panels, one an expert panel, and then a very short break, uh, and then we're going to have a senior uh, Sherpa perspective on, uh, on the G20 summit and the agenda uh, thereon. So uh, with no further ado, let me introduce uh, Dr. John Hamry, President and CEO of CSIS. Please. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm surprised to not see people dripping. You know, there's been a lot of water here these days. So glad to have you here. And that's a very important dialogue we're going to have this morning. And I want to say thanks to all of you for, for braving it to get here. Um, you know, there are two forms of internationalism. Uh, structural, treaty-based internationalism, uh, and then uh, consensus internationalism. Uh, we all know about structural internationalism, places like the United Nations, uh, IMF, you know, where countries spend time f developing a framework, a uh, structure, and it, it, it becomes, it's one of the dominant, it certainly has been characteristic of internationalism over the last 60 years. Uh, the advantage of it, of course, is that it's normative. You know, the next generation knows the things that are important because they've grown up with the institutions that shape the debate. But these institutions also become brittle over time, and they don't work as well over time. So there's a preference often with countries to use uh, consensus-based international, coalitions of the willing. You know, just find people that agree with you, let's go off and do it. The problem is it's, it's efficient, but it's not normative. It doesn't really carry over to the next big problem. Well, this is what the international world community has been wrestling with. And in many ways was the impulse to create the G20. You know, the, the, the IMF and the World Bank and the UN weren't going to be able to keep up and cope with the crisis as it was unfolding when the Great Recession was starting in 2008, 2009. But, you know, what were the institutions that were available that were more flexible. The G8, well, the G8 is, you know, it's considered to be, you know, it's a bunch of rich white guys. It certainly isn't considered to be representative uh, of the broad community. But how do you bring a big community together? Well, the international community chose uh, to create something, the G20. And I think it was enormously important in helping at a crucial time uh, to give a sense of direction. I mean, sovereign nations still had to implement things, but there needed to be some form and method to bring it together and get some shared coherence. Um, that's kind of the foundation where we got here, but now we ask the question, where is the G20 going? You know, is it really going to be uh, a normative structure over time? How does it do that? Uh, I, it's, uh, it's unclear. Uh, and part of that's the backdrop of what we're going to be dealing with today in this conversation. We're going to be thinking together, people that have a, an interest, how do we find shared purpose in an international way on such a complex problem uh, and not fall into the trap of having it, you know, drift into a structure that becomes brittle over time, you know. Is there legitimacy in this configuration? Certainly it's, it's more broadly based than the G8 is, you know, but, uh, but is it really, does it, have, does it have command power? 
you know. So these are these are the kinds of questions. Now we're lucky. One of the most skilled diplomats in the world is with us this morning. Sergei Kislyak is a very is a long-standing friend, and uh, we prevailed upon him to come. You know, n obviously because Russia is going to be the host for this G20 summit but also because of his personal talent as a diplomat. He's, of course, been in Washington during some pretty choppy days. Uh, these have not been the easiest times to be the Russian ambassador in Washington. But he's handled it with skill and uh, with enormous uh, strategic insight, and we're very fortunate that someone like him is here now. We, this is not the best of days in our relations with each other, but it's made dramatically better because of his presence and his ability. So would you, with your applause, please welcome the Honorable Sergei Kislyak. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for that kind of presentation, but I always feel a little bit oversold, and uh, that certainly raises my abs. And um, <clears throat> I was invited to make a welcoming uh, address now I am upgraded to keynote speaker, and I thank you for that. However, I was thinking how different my speech would be, and what's the difference between welcoming and keynote. And in my view, both are something that have uh, to help you to understand what is Russian view uh, on the organization that we are discussing. Several points. One. This is one of the youngest uh, multilateral mechanisms that is addressing the problems that are uh, unifying us all. And most probably it's one of the institutions where Russia and the United States, however being on different positions on many other issues, work very much together. So being in the same economic uh, crisis, both the United States, us, and the other countries brought us together into mechanism that may be short of being a directorate or normative setting, has formed a mechanism where people can discuss and reconcile national strategies in the multilateral world with very intertwined economies. And as such, G20, as far as I uh, understand, has proved to be rather efficient. I'm not suggesting that it was able to resolve all the issues of the crisis, but being upgraded, it wasn't created until 2008. It did exist prior to that in somewhat more working level formats. But in 2008, there was a decision made in order to have it on the level of the leaders, and that creates a kind of normative character to the whole kind of consensus that can be achieved with these uh, mechanisms. Russia being a country that has integrated in the world economy also quite recently, only 20, 22 years that uh, we are uh, integrated part of the, Russia, of the world market. That means for us that uh, we have high stakes in the vitality and the health of economic uh, relations in the world. We are interested in seeing to it that the international trade conditions would be favorable uh, for us as well. We certainly also depend on the markets outside Russia for well-being of Russia, being a, an important exporter of things. And uh, for us, being a in the chair of this organization, it's a pretty unique opportunity, not only to help together with the others to form a consensus on the current issues, but also to be able to contribute to the uh, solutions looking through the optics of our own problems and our own goals. The two main subjects that we have proposed for the G20 summit this year is sustained growth and uh, creating jobs. They are not necessarily new to the agenda of the G20, but the focus on these issues is very important because uh, specialists are focusing on how best to achieve that kind of strategy. Certainly, 
the national solutions and the national strategies will be decided by each and every country. But the way to reconcile it is to talk uh, about these issues in the 20. And I think currently you do not find another body that would be as uh, usable for that kind of stuff as G20, taking into account the composition of the countries that are involved. I would also like to say that Russia currently uh, <clears throat> enjoys pretty solid economic situation in relative terms, though. Uh, with uh, the average growth rate in uh, the world is about, what, 3, 3.2 percent. Russia enjoys 3.4. Is it enough for us? No, of course not. We wanted uh, much higher growth rate. We had it before the crisis, and we hope to be able to restore it in the future. But at the same time, it's still solid, and we hope it will be on increase within years to come. We are also fighting to increase our uh, job base. Uh, we uh, have an ambitious plans within years to come to create additional 25 million jobs. That means restructuring old jobs and creating absolutely new. All of this requires a lot, a lot of investment. So the creation of an environment for the investment is also one of our national priorities. Currently, uh, the climate uh, for investment, according to international ratings, isn't uh, among the top uh, 20, I would say. But I wish we have a chance to get in the same kind of format in five years. I bet we will be in the 20. We are working hard on creating conditions in Russia that would be considered by uh, uh, other outside investors. Uh, as good as in 20 best countries in the world. But even today, I think our investment climate is very much underrated, and we are doing much better than some uh, admit. At the same time, also when it comes to Russian economy, uh, we uh, have enjoyed pretty stable uh, fiscal environment. We have accumulated significant reserves. We have two funds, one sovereign fund, which is about 40, uh, $84 billion, and another reserve fund that is another 80 plus billion dollars. And the national reserves uh, are 500 uh, plus uh, billion dollars as well. Uh, we are almost debt free a country because our external trade uh, debt is no more than 2.5%, and including internal, uh, that uh, is uh, around 10, 11%. If you compare it with the ever say in the G8 countries, and uh, with the country uh, that hosts us today, I think we are doing, in relative terms, significantly better, and we have a rather solid view on how to move first, f uh, further. So. For us, G20 is a very important mechanism whereby we will try to harmonize national policies with the others in a way that would be advancing our national goals and also being part of the international community working on overcoming the remnants of the crisis because we stand to benefit from the healthy international economic environment as any other G20 country and many others. So currently, the uh, chairmanship uh, of, uh, in this organization brings a lot of additional uh, work for Russia, but we like it because it gives also us an opportunity to invite uh, the best specialists on all the economic uh, issues of the current situation, financial, uh, uh, job uh, creation specialist. Uh, in, in a week, uh, plus minus, we are going to have pretty unique forum that will bring together ministers of finance and ministers of labor of the G20. That is pretty unique forum as far as we understand that would give them a chance to discuss what can be done to address the priorities that we have. So uh, G20 is going to be a significant event in the economic uh, discussions in its own right 
it will be an important event uh, for us because of our in involvement in preparing it. And I hope it's going to be uh, another uh, confirmation that there are issues in the world where we all stand to benefit more by working together rather than uh, working against each other. And economics today is one of these areas. Thank you. So I am uh, just delighted to introduce the first of two former bosses uh, participating in today's program. Uh, Caroline Atkinson is the Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics at the White House. Uh, she is uh, an old colleague and friend of mine and boss, twice. Um, and uh, she has actually been at the White House for a couple of years working on uh, a range of international economic issues, um, all the important ones, uh, including uh, the G20, uh, which she has now inherited as the, uh, as the Sherpa for the United States. That is the President's uh, premier advisor on this uh, important summit. Um, she uh, has a very long and distinguished uh, career in um, international finance uh, at the Bank of England, at uh, the Washington Post, at, uh, at the Times of London, um, and of course at the U.S. Treasury Department where we worked together uh, a number of years ago. Um, and importantly, um, her biography says that she was born in Washington, D.C. Um, like me, that's also true. Uh, we have uh, parents of British uh, origin. And, but unlike me, uh, her parents were wise enough to, um, to spend enough time in the UK that she uh, picked up that wonderful accent, and I unfortunately uh, did not, uh, but uh, you'll, you'll see in a second. Uh, so with that, Carolyn, please uh, join us. Thanks. Thanks very, <coughs> Thanks very much, Matt. Yes, it does uh, require a little bit of explanation when I show up as uh, President Obama's uh, Sherpa, and in fact, at the G8, <coughs> David Cameron said, I've been wondering whose side you're, you're, you know, you're really on. Or, uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And I wanted, uh, just I was explaining to uh, our Russian colleague that I was just meeting with, uh, with my Russian sh uh, Sherpa counterpart. Uh, so we, he said, well, that's why she's not here. And I said, and that's what, she's why I'm late. So, um, and I think that goes to part of what is so valuable about the G20. I should declare an interest because uh, when Matt and I were working together at the Treasury Department, it was the, the birth of what became the G20. Uh, with the Asian crisis in the late 90s, it was clear that there wasn't really a right grouping of countries to discuss the important issues that that crisis uh, revealed. And the traditional G7 in those days uh, was too heavily dominated or, or just consisted of the advanced and big industrialized countries. But the crisis was going on in a part of the world that was really underrepresented in those groupings. And uh, I think it was Singapore, then Singapore leader Lee Kuan Yew, who uh, suggested to President Clinton that there should be some meeting of, uh, of officials and senior officials and ministers to discuss these important issues in a more global context. And President Clinton charged uh, Bob Rubin and Larry Summers, who subsequently then charged me, with putting together what was then the G22. I think the first meeting took place in the Willard Hotel, and it was called the Willard Group. And <clears throat> In those days, it was extremely difficult to figure out as we were developing which countries, obviously Indonesia, obviously Russia, uh, Brazil, uh, Turkey. It was, we didn't have counterparts that we clearly and usually were in contact with, we, we the United States. And uh, so we began to build up this network. And of course, uh, the, it, it subsequently evolved into a, a quite uh, established process of finance ministers and central bank governors meeting on a regular basis and became the, briefly was the G33 and then was the G20. And then that, I felt um, very pleased when the G20 kind of came into itself, uh, came into its own in 2008-9 with the global financial crisis, which of course uh, we'd all thought with the Asian financial crisis that that was the worst thing that could happen, but uh, we discovered that it could be worse <clears throat> with the whole globe starting in the US. And we realized that the G20 brought together 
uh, the countries that needed to be at the table when you had a global economic problem that required cooperative and coordinated action. And meeting at the leaders' level really helped to promote the breakthroughs <coughs> in London 2009 that was so important for uh, <coughs> helping to pull the global economy back from the, uh, from the brink of uh, the worst, it was the worst recession since the Second World War, but it could have been the worst depression. So at that um, stage, I think the G20 kind of proved itself in those early days. It proved itself as a way that you could get leaders focused to drive other uh, economic institutions to take the kind of action that was, that was needed in a, and a, to understand the spillovers from one country to another. Since then, of course, uh, things have changed a lot. And the G20 has a, a, a new and not less acute, but complex challenge now, I think, which is how to deal with more chronic uh, issues of a need for coordination. My personal view and, and the view of, uh, of uh, my government and my president is that the G20 remains extremely important. It is. It was sort of dubbed the premier economic forum uh, after 2008-2009 for global economic uh, coordination and debate, and I th think it remains that. But the problems that we now face are not uh, the acute ones of financial crisis. They're more chronic ones of uh, still too slow recovery from the crisis, still too high unemployment in many countries, including here, and we still face the issues of how we can all work together so that our economic policies are supportive within the framework of you know, sustained, balanced, uh, and strong growth in a way that, uh, that we can understand each other. Now, in the past couple of years, as many of you will know, and Matt certainly knows, these summits have tended to be dominated by an acute crisis, again, not the global crisis, but the European crisis. And uh, in Cannes, which was uh, my first uh, G20 summit in, in this current role, working from the White House, completely dominated by what was happening with uh, Greece had just called a referendum and, uh, and, and so on. In Los Cabos, uh, it was another very interesting moment for the G20 because although some of the emerging markets sometimes feel, well, uh, we don't get to discuss what the big countries do and, 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 and we want to have a voice in their policies because they affect us, I think that really happened in Mexico, and if you go back and look at the leader's statement, you will see that uh, the Europeans, who were at that stage in the sort of cross crosshairs, if you like, with the crisis, really put on the table some important uh, steps that they planned to take. And of course, after the June uh, Los Cabos summit, there were important steps taken in Europe that really lowered the temperature and, and helped to provide financial healing. As we look at the agenda this year, and we have the IMF, and I know David Lipton, my former colleague, will be coming later, we have the IMF telling us all that the global outlook in their latest uh, release is, is worse than they expected and that we expected, <coughs> excuse me, um, just recently. And I think that um, we in the US are finding that the recovery is perhaps a little stronger than was expected and, the, and there is healing going on, but we still recognize we have work to do. If we look at the rest of the world, almost everywhere other than Japan, interestingly enough, the outlook is more disappointing uh, and with uh, not maybe the big downside risks, but still with a lot of concerns than had been expected just a few weeks ago. So we think that uh, a focus that leaders will want again to focus on how we can uh, really get this recovery on a steady and strong path. That is the big challenge for us, for us all, in all of our countries. Uh, and I think that what's been happening in emerging markets just recently, well, thanks so much, <coughs> will also, yeah, will also uh, put an extra interest 
from, from the whole group on these basic uh, macro questions. Uh, last year, uh, as Europe and well, it wasn't clear how quickly we were getting out of our recovery, unemployment had not yet decisively turned down, and, um, and Europe obviously was, was uh, still struggling with a lot of difficult issues, the emerging markets looked as if they could decouple. And I think we've seen more recently that as uh, th that that a lot of emerging markets remain concerned, and it's important for the big, uh, non not not so industrialized countries, to uh, have that discussion with uh, around a table that includes all of the major economies, 80% of GDP, about how the different policies that we all carry out affect each other, and that's not always an easy way, to, an easy conversation to have, but it is a critical one because it helps us to understand better how things seem from other parts of the world, and that's true from everybody else's point of view. So there are other issues that over the years have been added to the agenda, and I was just having a debate yesterday uh, with one of my other Sherpa colleagues who was saying really the whole, we should do a kind of back to basics and only worry about the global economy uh, debate. But I, I don't really agree with that because I think that <clears throat> part of the power of the G20 also is that these countries, if we make policy commitments, uh, they can have an important role in setting a global agenda and in affecting uh, the, the global economy in a larger sense, not just the fiscal and current account deficits, but other important areas. And one of the important steps that the G20 has taken in recent years, which might seem uh, not central to a global macro debate, but is of enormous importance in the world, was um, to agree not to put on export bans for food products at times of shortage. And that has been a really important, that helped a lot of countries to, uh, to explain to their domestic audiences why they would not, uh, in times of shortage, think of resorting to an export food brand. And we know from work that the IMF and others has done that these export bans actually worsened uh, the global food crisis. It's just an example of how in a global world, what any country does can really have a quick and immediate impact. And that's led to a quite important development of more transparency in agricultural pricing. There is a group that meets that talks about that and promotes uh, that, which helps markets to work better. <clears throat> Another key area is trade. Now, we're always saying, and, I, and most of the G20, you know, it's our position that trade, the G20 is not a place to be doing trade negotiations. In fact, in a way, the Sherpas are the, the sort of masters of all and, and, and of none. Uh, we don't really know in great detail about anything, but we uh, try to represent our leaders on a whole bunch of topics. So on trade, for example, what we can do is give a political push. Two years ago in Cannes, it was quite important that after years and years of repeating that we were going to complete the Doha round very quickly, uh, leaders agreed that it was time to look at fresh and credible approaches in order to uh, revive the multilateral trading round. And they also earlier had agreed to a standstill on, uh, on protectionist measures. And there was a piece in the newspaper, I think yesterday, by uh, Arvind Subramanian about how protection was the dog that didn't didn't bark. And I think I don't want to claim everything for the G20, but the fact that leaders were there, they were able to come to agreement that they would resist the temptation to put on protectionist measures despite the enormous challenges faced in their economies was one important element in helping to preserve the open trading system. And this year, uh, of course, there's been a lot of focus, especially in the US and especially on the, on the uh, trade priorities of the US and my predecessor, Mike Froman, with both the Trans-Pacific Partnership and more recently the launch of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP. And there's some question of wh where is the world trading system going? I think the G20 can send also an important signal that we care about the WTO and the maintenance and, and re revitalization, if you like, of the WTO and the multilateral trading, uh, trading round. 
And we're very uh, hopeful that in Bali, when the WTO meets later this year, it will be possible to reach an agreement around a package that is of genuine value to all of the nations around trade facilitation, maybe goes a little further than that, but is a step forward rather than a repeat of, uh, of discussions that had not been getting anywhere much. And that the trade area and climate is another very important area and energy security. These are all um, areas <coughs> where traditionally there had been a sort of view that emerging and uh, that advanced economies were kind of on one side and then emerging economies and developing countries were on a different, should be treated differently. And I think as we um, have worked around the G20 table and bilaterally and in other groups, it's clearer and clearer that the emerging, the major economies need to talk about these issues on a sort of, um, not that everybody's the same, but on a basis where we recognize that we all have obligations. And this came up, you will have seen probably in today's newspaper, in our discussions this week with China, there was a recognition that we need to have a joint climate uh, plan. In trade and climate and other things, what the major economies do in the emerging world is important for the international system, just as what the big industrialized economies do. So another um, couple of issues that I think have been very important in that the G20 has championed them. Uh, in the energy field, in 2009, we called for a phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies, wasteful fossil fuel subsidies. And everybody could sign up to that, but then the next question was, oh, well, okay, what is a subsidy and what is a wasteful one? And, and a lot of debate about that. This year, under Russian leadership, We've moving more, taking steps towards uh, looking at a peer review, maybe involving some of the international institutions, so that uh, there's more transparency and understanding about uh, about uh, the the need to act on fossil fuel subsidies. The IMF did this great work in the spring, showing you know there's half a trillion dollars a year spent holding down the prices of uh, fossil fuels, which if you think that with the other part of our brains. In some countries, uh, people are looking at ways to price carbon and to raise the price of carbon. Uh, at least you want to start off with not uh, subsidizing it. But of course, that's a very difficult political issue in many countries, but it's one that we think uh, we need to work on more and more, especially as the cost of these subsidies has become really, really crippling for some countries on their, uh, on their fiscal policies. Um, there are other issues, taxes, where the G8 looked at uh, tax policy internationally, but really the G20 needs to be involved in, in that debate, and we look forward to that being one of the issues that comes up in, uh, in Russia as well. Corruption, which a lot of people, you know, 10 years ago might have said it's not, that's not really an economic issue. We know it is an economic issue, and it may not be, may not be such an economic issue uh, in work and business and so on in what was the G7, but it certainly is an issue as we think about cross-border investment and how to help uh, promote uh, development. And that's the development be my last point. Uh, in the old days, the G7 and then the G8 would talk about development very much and they would invite some uh, leaders from the poorest regions in the world, from Africa, and it would be very much, uh, th and you may remember the demonstration, it would be very much a move from uh, NGOs and, and also from the country, the, the African or poorer countries themselves to say to the richer ones, well, you're rich, what are you gonna do to help us? Where's your aid, where's your debt forgiveness and so on? And then the rich countries would be trying to push each other to do a bit more and be offering stuff. That debate has really changed in the G8 where last year and this year under the US and the UK presidency, there's been a broader group of developing countries brought together and a very different debate where it's much more about what can we do together as partners? What can developing countries themselves, the poorest ones do to attract the kind of private capital that they need. We all recognize the game is not in aid, the game is in, the real game is in both trade and also uh, private capital and domestic resource mobilization. And in the G20, I think it helped to push that recognition into the G8 and also to show that 
uh, it's no longer what is the G7 giving to Africa. We, all, we know that China's investment in sub-Saharan Africa is very important. We know that Brazil has technologies that can help food production in uh, tropical areas if they share those. So there is much more of a kind of common interest in how uh, this kind of sharing and uh, mutual support can help to advance goals as different as both the development goals, but also the original uh, global economy ones and financial regulation and so on. And also through the whole gamut of areas that touch on how successful our international global and financial system can be for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Uh, just a breathtaking uh, um, presentation of the scope of the G20's work and her responsibilities, which are um, vast, and it's hard to see how one human being can cover all that ground. We're going to talk more sorry, with help. No, we're at the back. That's true. You do have help. You have yaks, uh, having been a yak myself. Uh, we're very <laughs> proud of what we do for Sherpas. Um, uh, so Caroline has time for, I think, a few questions. Um, so if, if you do have a question, please uh, wait for the microphone, which I think are uh, floating, and uh, please identify yourself and please make the question short. Thanks. Do you want to recognize people? Sure, yeah, sure, that's okay. fine. Anybody yeah. have a, take a first stab? Down there, Anyone I see. There? Yeah. And if you can say who you are that, uh, as you ask your question. Sure, my name is Anna Yukonanov. I'm a reporter with Reuters. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about some of the uh, issues that are likely to come up at the most, the uh, next uh, G20 meetings, and especially uh, Fed policy. Uh, what, how you will respond to some of the concerns emerging markets have raised about spillover effects and other issues like that. Thank you. Well, I'm not going to get into Fed policy. It's a simple rule for those of us in the White House. Uh, I will just say that I think what's important and what we see as important is, uh, and I think this is true for every country in the G20, that we need to um, bear in mind the importance of strengthening our own economies. And then we need to strengthen our own economies in a way that supports the global economy. And that's certainly the sort of focus of US policy. We want to make, uh, we, we want to, and, and we took very dramatic steps early on in the crisis on our banking system, monetary policy and, and fiscal policy to halt the uh, decline and promote recovery. And of course, what every country does affects every other country, and that's something that the G20 provides a good forum for discussion. Uh, and the most, the sort of guiding light, if you like, of the G20 is that countries should be uh, mindful of, uh, well, countries should talk about what it is that they can do to reinforce a strong global economy. Robert Rogowski, um, Georgetown. Could, I, I know that <clears throat> trade's something you only tangentially talk on I in the G20, but could you go a little bit further about what you're seeing ahead for the next couple of years in terms of supporting the multilateral negotiation and I in addition to all of the, 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 the many, many FTAs, but there must be a strong trade agenda coming up. Could you talk a little bit about what, what we'll see, and, and particularly support for the multilateral? Yeah, as I said, we think that the multilateral uh, agenda is very important, and that's why we have been putting an enormous amount of energy into having a successful uh, agreement or successful um, negotiations in Bali, which will come after this, G, this year's G20. So. What I would hope is that the G20 is able to provide some political support for such an agreement centered around the core of trade facilitation where there's been some quite interesting work done in Geneva and also a lot of work, I think it's the OECD has calculated how um, 
measures on trade facilitation can help, importantly, all kinds of countries, and possibly the support in, for, for uh, trade and GDP is even greater in developing countries where there may be more uh, barriers for moving goods to market in, in, a, in a smooth and efficient way. So we think that that's an important element of the, of the multilateral trade negotiations. Yeah. There's one here. Thank you, Ruby. Um, Aikengum. Um, there's been a new focus on um, economic relations and U.S. Russian relations and the establishment of the commission between uh, Dmitry Medvedev and uh, Joe Biden. And the Ambassador Kislak just said some very important things about the. Um, Russian interest in the global economy, and you've just met, you said you came from a meeting with Ksenia Yudayeva, the G20 Sherpa. Can you tell me if there's anything particularly Russian about this agenda? Like in the past, you've had countries that have really had a, uh, uh, a mark on it. Is there anything you see as um, uh, important in terms of our own understanding of Russia or of the way the G20 should be shaped from a Russian point of view? Yeah, the ambassador spoke to that, and I know that uh, Ksenia is coming later. So I would prefer to let them define what they see as uh, as the sort of hallmarks of uh, of this from a Russian perspective. All I would say is that, of course, every chair has a particular mark, but at the same time, every chair is responsive uh, both to immediate events. So if you look at the Los Cabos uh, summit that was statement that was in Mexico, there was actually a fair amount of detail about, as I mentioned, about European uh, economic policy, as well as a number of other issues. Um, and then part of, the, part of the point of the G20 is also that it is a, a global agenda. So there is a balance al always between uh, the recognition of the global issues and the common issues and then the particular uh, areas where where the chair pushes, but I think it it sh it's up, should be up to the chair to describe those. Thanks. How are you? Thank you very much for um, your remarks. With the upcoming, oh, I'm sorry, Karen Tramontano, Blue Star Strategies. With the upcoming G20 Labor Minister uh, Finance Minister meeting, do you see um, any room for a discussion of getting beyond fiscal policy and monetary policy to labor market policy and more inclusive growth and job development, since there is a huge job deficit? Thank you. Well, I think that increasingly we, we have been uh, putting the issue of jobs and growth, growth and jobs, growth and job creation on the agenda of, uh, and, and in fact, Russia this year made very clear that that was one of the uh, sort of key areas of focus for this year's summit. And I think that has only become more evident as the year has gone on. And, uh, and we fully support that. I also believe that the uh, coincidence of the labor and finance ministers, you know, they're having one day overlapping, I believe, uh, and we'll have some outcome from that, is particularly uh, Appetite this year. It's a very good year for that discussion to occur. And I, I expect that, I, I am hopeful that there can be some uh, progress in understanding. We, we also believe that one should be talking about a growth strategy and not just a, you know, a separate fiscal strategy and a separate macro one. The, 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 in the end, if you ask what the leaders and their and their people want. Um, and of course, we can characterize growth in different ways. You use the word inclusive, which matters as strong, sustainable, balanced, all of this. But you know, we're really all talking about the need for growth and improved living standards. Thank you. <laughs>